For those of you following this series, we just did a video on um, the first part. This is actually the second part of a two-part series. The first part was where we um, kind of went over the specs of this laptop, identified the actual model. It is a V50, even though it has a 40 megahertz uh, DX246 processor, but hey, <laughs> I'm not going to nitpick. Um, it also uh, had a dead CMOS battery, and uh, I identified the battery, and I ordered one, and it just arrived a little while ago, um, well, earlier today, I just came home, so <laughs> I popped the battery in and reassembled the laptop, um, so now the uh, CMOS uh, settings will be retained, it will no longer nag me every single time I turn it on or restart it. We did remove the bridge battery, which is used to keep the uh, system, um, sorry, the contents of memory. Um, in, uh, let me rephrase that. It, what it does is it keeps the memory powered up when the laptop is um, suspended for just a few minutes if the battery were to die. That way we could um, <clears throat> either plug it in or, re or swap the battery over without losing any um, content. It kind of works like the batteries that are inside a RAID um, cabinet. Or what happens is if, the, if it's writing data to the drives and there's a momentary power loss, it'll keep the, um, <clears throat> the data in suspense until power is restored and the drives spin back up again. Kind of like that. The, the, the bridge battery is designed to retain contents in memory for a period of about five minutes while the battery is swapped or power is applied. But because that battery was now a leak hazard, I had to remove it. I did actually film the reassembly process, but I just accidentally deleted all the footage. Damn. <laughs> That's okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to rebuild this machine. It currently has a copy of, um, actually currently has nothing on it. I have wiped it out, and, oh, I've already wiped out the drive and I need to, I need to do this again. My intention was to kind of run through a basic uh, build of a DOS Windows 3.1 machine so you could all see and enjoy it. Now we're going to boot this from a DOS 622 set. It's a three disc set. Here's the, uh, what it looks like. And uh, anyway, so disk number one, I'm going to fire it up, and it'll boot right from the floppy drive. Notice how the new battery prevents the laptop from nagging me and asking me for date and time information, as well as BIOS and hard drive settings. Um, that is what we were really aiming to fix. The main battery in this laptop is really no good. Um, it's junk it won't even power it for a second. As soon as I pull the power plug, it just shuts off. I may toy with the idea or the notion of rebuilding the pack. I know it can be done on these older machines pretty easily because they're not, they're not smart batteries. They're, they're very basic batteries and uh, the laptop, I don't believe there's any monitoring going on inside that pack. I think it's just a simple um, pack that outputs maybe two or three different voltages, like 3.3, 5, and 12, or something like that. Um, I think that's how it works. I'm not sure exactly, but I should find out anyway. All right, once we boot from this uh, disk number one, it's a pretty simple process. Now, we're running this off of the upgrade copy. If you find a copy of DOS 622 upgrade, you have to do the install a little different. Okay, we're going to exit the installer by hitting F3 twice, and we're going to type FDisk. We're going to wipe out any existing partitions. Now this has some... I, I had been... What I was trying to do originally was I, I was trying to bring the... Um, or to, to make the hibernation... Uh, system hibernation file... Um, let me go back a little bit. Um, when the laptop goes into hibernation mode, or deep sleep or whatever, what it's going to do is store the contents of memory in, onto a file on the hard drive. Now for that to work there has to be what's called a hibernation file or a partition depending on how the system works. 
this laptop did not have, when I got it, it did not have the hibernation partition or the file. So I'm not sure how it's supposed to be configured. I've been looking for, um, I've been looking for documentation on this, but I have found nothing. I did find the hardware utilities disc on NEC's website and the owner's manual, none of which seemed to help me at all. So I've been playing with different partition options, either a uh, blank space with no partition, and I've tried a partition that was formatted, and nothing seems to allow me to, to do what I want to do. It doesn't work, is what I'm saying. So what we're going to do first is we're going to display the partition information by pressing number 4, and we're going to see that there is, looks like one partition on the drive. It uses 90% hard disk space. We're going to take that away, and we're going to make it 100%. So I'm going to go to delete, which is option 3. I'm going to delete the primary. Yes, I want to delete that. Enter the system volume, or the volume, it's the system. Yes, I'm sure. Okay, escape to continue. Create DOS partition, create primary DOS. Use 100% of the disk space. Wait a second. I think that worked. <laughs> now we're going to restart the machine. Now this is where it gets interesting. When you're working with an upgrade copy of DOS, it requires an existing operating system. All it has to have is the uh, system boot files and that's it. It doesn't need anything else. So what we need to do for this to work is we need to actually format drive C and uh, format it as a system disk. So we're going to escape the installer yet again then we're going to run that uh, format utility. So that will get us back to where we need to be. I'm going to hit F3 twice. One, two, and format space C colon forward slash S. And it's going to do two things. It's going to format the drive as a bootable DOS 622 drive. It's also going to check for any defective or bad sectors. And um, now here's the thing with, with older drives. Now this drive is from 1994. It is the original drive. And uh, if it had any bad clusters, now's the time to find out because we're going to start piling software onto this sucker. Now, if a drive has bad clusters, it's not necessarily the end of the world. It just means that the drive is in the process of basically failing. And you don't know why those bad clusters are there. It's impossible to tell. It can happen through misuse, mishandling, while the laptop is in operation. Now, I saw this happen as recently as about... Um, Eight years ago, I was working on a laptop for someone. It was a, a laptop that was purchased for a child. And it was an Acer Travelmate, I believe. Very, very poor quality laptop, by the way. Don't ever buy one of those. <laughs> they were garbage. Anyway, this laptop had been dropped off the couch and at, at some point in its life. And I found that that drive had bad clusters on and I explained to the owner that you know you might want to tell your daughter to to not you know just use it on a desk don't don't be using it on the sofa because kids you know they don't know how to properly handle sensitive electronics like these old laptops were um, you know, modern laptops will instantly park the heads if it senses any acceleration or any um, uneven movement or, or, or sudden, move, sudden movement. But this laptop didn't have that feature. That hard drive didn't have the auto park feature. And the laptop did not have a 3D accelerometer to determine, you know, the laptop's position. And neither did these older ones right here. So if they were mishandled while in operation, there's a very good chance that the heads could crash or that is contact the disk surface and it would cause physical damage to the platters. Um, so I explained again. I explained to this to this individual that you know you need to be really careful because, yep, you know, doesn't take much to uh, to wipe out a drive. So I don't know how that ever turned out. I was able to format the drive. I knew how the drive was damaged, so I wasn't concerned. Um, I formatted it, reinstalled the OS, and everything was good. Now we're going to enter a system label or a drive label. Now I'm going to enter. 
system as the label for that drive. And you'll notice there are no bad clusters. Um, it'll actually say, right, it'll be a, another line here that says number of bad clusters, and we're in good shape. This drive is healthy. So I'm going to do Control-Alt-Delete, and I'm going to boot it off the drive yet again, floppy drive. So anyway, a modern-day laptop with a mechanical drive um, will have the ability to park the heads instantly. As a matter of fact, my MacBook Pro has this built in, and um, it actually, I believe the, Mac, the newer MacBook Pros depend on the, um, well, mine, I call my newer, it's six years old. But it depends not on the hard drive's accelerometer, which they have now, but it depends on the one built into the logic board. Which is why if you install, I'm just going to hit enter to continue, we're going to continue setup, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Check the date and time. Look at it, it's keeping the date and time. Awesome. I want that. That's that's what I need. Um, now, it shows up as a two-digit year, which is 16, so it's going to think it's 1916. But that's okay. The dates line up all right. It's not going to really screw us up too much. Uh, yes, those settings are correct. CDOS is our installation path. All right, here we go. Now, um, SSDs obviously don't have any moving parts, so it's not even an issue anymore. Um, but uh, oh yeah, so what I was what I was talking about is on the MacBook Pros. Well, at least I'm, I can only speak for the 2011, 2012, 2013 models. Um, if you were to install a hard drive that had its own accelerometer, as I did this on my 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 2010 MacBook Pro, or 2009. What happens is the drive's accelerometer and the motherboard's accelerometer conflict with each other and that uh, drive parking feature doesn't work correctly anymore. So you actually have to run a Unix command that disables the onboard accelerometer um, and then it, it just works off of the hard drive's built-in accelerometer. So an accelerometer is a chip, it's a solid-state device that can detect movement and the direction of movement. Uh, they're used in a variety of electronics um, and IBM I believe was one of the first ones to have these. The IBM ThinkPad, it was called Active Protection and you could run a utility on there that would actually, you could pick the laptop up and it would show you a picture of the laptop right on screen and as you move the laptop around the laptop that's on the screen would move with the movement of the real laptop. It was the coolest thing. My my ThinkPad uh, T43 had that, and I thought that was so awesome. But they're no longer really necessary um, as hard drives are moving into the SSD territory. So an SSD, you could throw it across the room and it won't affect it. But you do that with a mechanical drive and you're asking for trouble. Now, how do these older laptops protect against drive movement? As you know, these older hard drives were fragile by nature. They were big, they were heavy. Here's one right here. This one is from 1993, I believe. Now, this is, a, this is an 80-something megabyte drive, <laughs> and it's big, it's chunky, and it's very low-tech compared to modern. I mean, this thing's got socketed chips on it, for freaking sake. Um... I mean, it's got socketed chips. It's 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 very well made for for its time, but a drive like this can't withstand much of an impact while it's running. As soon as you touch it, it just and not only is it it's slow. This is a I think this is a 5400 RPM drive, and um, well maybe not. I don't know what the speed is actually on this one. I should look that up. But uh, it's a very uh, maybe 4,500 RPM. It's a fairly low rotational speed on this sucker. So um, there's not as much of a Bernoulli effect. Or no, but it's not Bernoulli. I'm, I'm thinking of the air cushion between the head and the platter. See, as the platters are spinning, they generate a, a certain amount of, uh, of air that circulates within the drive. And that air causes the heads to float above the surface. A drive like this has no 3D accelerometer. The laptop wouldn't have it either. Um, so these drives depended on physical um, protection. In other words, they would actually be mounted sometimes even in a silicone or rubber um, 
uh, mounting system or in the case of the Panasonic Toughbooks these drives would be mounted in a uh, in a rubber sh uh, uh, kind of like a shell or a, a rubber cocoon and it provided the drive with some protection against shock but it wasn't terribly effective uh, so this particular laptop has absolutely no protection against sudden movement what these older laptops would do is the drive would automatically spin down when it wasn't being accessed. So basically without any form of protection you would have to be very conscious of what the laptop is doing whenever you decided to drop it off a, off a, off a table. Now if you realize the absurdity of what I just said you realize that uh, it's pretty much luck of the draw. So <laughs> <laughs> just you had to be very very gentle and very cautious with these older laptops and and that's my point enter disk 3 so yeah hard drive failures on older laptops uh, was pretty much a daily occurrence it just happened there wasn't much you could do to prevent it um, other than just be very careful, um, you know. My own MacBook Pro, the one that I uh, that I use now, the 2011 one. Um, I mean, I, I hear that drive click off all the time. I'm, I use it on my couch now. That's where it lives. It lives on the on the on the uh, arm on my uh, couch's um, right arm. And every time I get out of the couch, every time I move it or shift it around, it automatically parks with a with a confirming clunk or a dink. So, and you can hear it all the time. It's always doing that uh, because I'm always moving it around. And that's, you know, that's, that's good. It means the accelerometer is doing its job. It's sensing movement and it's parking the drive or unloading. The term is actually unloading where it, it actually pulls the heads off of the spinning disc onto like a ramp assembly that prevents the heads from contacting the disc surface no matter what. And it's very effective. One of these days, I should take a hard drive apart and show you exactly what that looks like. I might even have one here, but yeah, I don't want to do that right now. <laughs> so yeah. Now this drive right here, while we're while we're dicking around with this DOS install, uh, this is an IDE Connor. Uh, this came out of a Compaq. You know, I know that because it says Compaq on it. But the funny thing is, I don't remember what laptop this came out of. But you know, if I think back hard enough. I think this came out of a Contora 425. That'd be a 4625 megahertz model. Yeah, that's exactly where this came from, come to think of it. Because um, I had one in here at one time. It was one that I pulled out of the trash. Oh yeah, it's all coming back to me now. Pulled it out of the trash, but it had smashed hinges. It was pretty much destroyed. So I, um, I, I scavenged the hard drive out of it, and... Uh, that was it. So now we're going to let it boot up on its own. And uh, we're going to install Windows 3.1. Why Windows 3.1 and why not Linux? Well, again, just like the SSD uh, question that I get asked a lot, I tried to build laptops to, to kind of represent a certain point in history. So, at no point in 1994 was this laptop sold with Linux. It just didn't happen. And while Linux was still in its early development stages, Unix was not. You know, Unix was, uh, was, was well established, but you know, there were... I'm not a historian when it comes to Linux, but it did exist. Um, I think Red Hat may have existed, actually. I'm not sure which other distributions would have been available, but it did exist in 1994. But we're not building a Linux machine. We're building a Windows 3.1 machine, which is why I salvaged this laptop, because I had every intention from day one of turning it into my Windows 3.1 laptop. So I'm going to go to Drive A and enter Setup, and it's going to launch the Windows installer. I love this screen. This is the the high-end TFT display that was available for this laptop. And by the way, according to my, my homework that I've done, I 
I cannot seem to find any reference. I'm going to do the express uh, setup option, by the way, just automatic settings. Put it on cruise control. I cannot find any reference for a pen option on this laptop. All I know is this screen is not the pen compatible screen. That's all I know. Um, I did find the owner's manual for this, as I said earlier, um, but it does not reference any touch options. So, and that explains why the trackball is built the way it is in the front of the machine. I think I, I showed this to you guys a little earlier, but this is the trackball. And uh, yes, I did clean this trackball. Um, it is running really nice now. Feels much better. Very, very precise. I want to talk about this trackball for a second. Because, um, you know, I do remember using laptops with trackballs. And, uh, you know, they were, in my opinion, one of the greatest pointing devices in the history of laptops. Because, I mean, they took some getting used to. But they beat the alternative, which was usually nothing. Um, the problem with trackballs, though, was they were mechanical. And they did require frequent cleaning. Because lint and other you know, oils from your hands would get in there and they would actually um, coat the rollers, just like they do on, uh, on a ball mouse, a mechanical ball mouse. So there was always the need to clean the trackball. You know, it was, it was a pain in the ass, and you had to do it. And uh, while we're talking about trackballs, let's take a look at one of the greatest laptops that had a trackball as a standard option. Standard feature, as a matter of fact. I'm going to put this aside. Oh, hey, there's that hard drive. This is my, um, this is an, uh, this is the one I was thinking of. This is the 80 megabyte drive that I pulled out of the, the Epson, the Epson, it was an action note. Turned out to be an inaction note. But that was the hard drive from that one. All right. Still functions, too. I'm going to put my name in here. All right, here we go. Ah, there we go. I'm just gonna, we're just going to let that fly. Look at that. Our mouse works. It didn't take long. But look at how quickly it, it, it is to... Look how fast... Windows 3.1 installed. It's, it's amazing. So which laptop are we going to pull today? That's not all of them. My IBM 760XL is not up here. And neither is my... Um, here, i got another one kicking around. i got two more laptops over there. Two Windows laptops. One of them is under my desk and one of them is on that chair. But the one we're going to look at right now is the... Peanut butter 180. Actually, no, it's a 170. 170, that's what... This used to have the 180 in it. I sold the 180, and I only have the 170 now. But, we're going to take a good look at that right now. Don't mind my laundry. I just did laundry today, and it's all over the place. i got to put it away. All right. We're going to need the power supply. What's in here, anyway? Oh, like a floppy disk. What's this? A zip? Is there a zip drive in here? Panas oh, here's my uh, here's my SCSI CD-ROM drive. I was wondering where the hell that went. But it looks like there's a zip drive in a zip disk in there. Check that out of there. I'm not sure what that's doing there. Anyway, it's uh. To insert disk number four. And get the rest of these. I bought this copy of Windows on eBay. This actually would have shipped with an IBM PS1 value point, I think. I believe that's uh, that's what this would have shipped with originally. But back then, <laughs> it didn't matter where it came from. Hey! I do have a SCSI zip drive. Isn't it great when you're looking for your stuff and you find stuff you didn't know you had? Look at that. I actually have one of these. I didn't even know that. Honest to God, I didn't even know I had that. But now that I think about it, I do remember buying one. I think I got it on eBay. 
But um, I'll be damned. I just came here to get this. Now this is going to kind of segue us into my next video while we're waiting for this to install. We're going to kind of do a sec kind of a, a, a preview of what's to come. And uh, I think you guys are going to like it. I think you will. I think some of you who actually like this channel, like all three of you, you're going to love this. Because I've been planning this out for a while. All right, Let's put that aside for now. But what I want to do is I want to do a video of that right there. Now that Kodak DC40 is interestingly enough, uh, it's been speculated that it is actually <laughs> just this, it's the same camera as the Apple Quick Take. Uh, 150 I believe and uh, it's the same damn camera or the same cam dammer all right just five but I need to uh, we need to power this thing up to see if it still runs someday I'll do a video of that joystick but not today um, Yes, we were right here. Get this out of my way. I don't, I don't have my MacBook here anymore, so it kind of doesn't need to be there. Is that? That goes here. Okay. Now, this one has uh, the power door option that I put on there. That was a, that's a rare option. You can't really find those anywhere anymore, but they're neat. So let's open this baby up. Now this is the PowerBook 170 that had the hinges, or the, the entire back cover replaced. The brand new old stock part. This is a very, very, very nice example of the 170. Which is why I'm never selling it. Um, let's see if it still runs though. Maybe I'll change my mind. But I wanted to point out the trackball on this one. This is actually made by Logitech. And I know why. It's one of the best. Because Logitech had, they had a better design for their trackballs than the NEC Versa had. There we go. So you twist it back enough, it comes out. These retaining rings have a tendency to lose their clips, but this one is not. This is, this is one that's in actually good condition. But you'll see that these little red things, they look like, um, they look like beady little red eyes. Can you see that? There's one here here, and there should be one on this side here. Those are the bearings that the ball rides on. And it rides really smoothly. So, because of, because of the properties of sapphire, or at least man-made sapphire, um, this ball rolls smoothly, and those bearings don't wear out. They really don't. And um, I mean, they might develop a slight flat spot as they break in, but that, that's it. But it's like riding on glass. Very smooth, very effective. This machine has a trackball that's mounted. Not only is it like this, so the weight is kind of not quite on those uh, balls or on those uh, bearings. But the bearings are made out of steel, possibly stainless steel. So you know, once the stainless steel, which is coated with, I believe, a, like a chromium type substance. Once that wears away, it doesn't really roll that nicely. This one doesn't seem to have that problem, but it's certainly not as smooth. Now the other problem, or the other downfall to this trackball is its size. It's a very small trackball, so it's jumpy. It doesn't move very smoothly. This trackball is much larger, so it's a little more precise. Now we're going to install, a, uh, I'm going to just install the um, Apple Laser Writer, Apple Image Writer. Is there an Image Writer driver in here? I thought there was. A laser Writer? No. C Ito 8510 is a driver that is compatible with the Apple Image Writer, by the way, in case you didn't know. Uh, now you know. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Um, 
I'm not going to need any, no, I don't have any of these drivers or any of these printers, so we're going to do a no printer attached option. But look at that, it's populating all the icons. Now, while we're, while we're here, we're going to let it do its thing. I'm going to, i got to hit return on that. So what it's going to do is it's going to detect all the DOS applications. We're going to skip the tutorial. And it's going to create program icons for everything. Anyway, let's take the disk out and reboot it. And we're going to talk a little bit about our Apple Power Mac, PowerBook. So the PowerBook 170, let, let's just get this out of the way. Um, this was actually a salvage machine that I got from work when I first started. When I, like the day I started and I took over, I started kind of going through... Um, so I took over a job from a guy that had been there for 12 years. And I'm fast approaching on that myself now. But he had been there for 12 years. And he, um, he used to hoard things. <laughs> and when I took over the job, I, uh, I pretty much was handed the keys to the kingdom. And I kind of went through everything we had. Uh, for the entire organization, which consists of several buildings. I mean, we're talking like, it, it was an overwhelming task for me. I had to take over the entire tech service department, if you will. It was all mine. Everything was all mine. My kingdom, in a way. Not really, but yeah, in a way. So I went through every closet. I went through all of his hiding spots, and I found all kinds of junk everywhere. And in that junk, I found this PowerBook 170, and it was in really good condition. So I took it home, I bought some parts for it, I fixed it up, I bought, I bought a couple of parts machines, I replaced the hard drive, actually, I think twice. But I managed to find the only remaining new old stock rear panel cover that was available. I bought two of them. I sold one, and I kept the one for this one. I wish I had kept the other one, honestly. But anyway, let's just power it up, and then we'll move back to our original sub. Ooh, this looks good. I actually did replace the clock battery in this uh, when I put it back together again, but that was nearly 10 years ago. So, um... Listen to that drive. Wow. Hear that? Okay. <laughs> it's been a while since this thing has been, been running, so please accept my, uh, let me turn this light off. Please understand why I'm so nervous about it firing up again. But anyway, it's loud. Drive is located right about here. But she fired right up. This actually needs a new LCD display. I gotta, I gotta go looking for one because um, what happens is the corners are starting to turn dark, and there's nothing you can do about it. It just, it happens after it's been on for a while, and uh, it's just not much you can do. I remember where the um, so I can change the background to something a little something that'll actually yeah this one right here there we go it looks to me like this this machine still has a functioning battery I'm gonna check the date and time on it if it's defaulted to 1956 then I'll know yeah the battery's dead and it's gonna need a new battery again that's a shame. It's actually soldered in. It's easy to change, but you just have to desolder it. But uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to pick up another battery for it. Anyway, back to what we were originally going to do. I'm going to let the old power book run for a little while, just to, you know... Like starting up an old car, you want it to run as much as possible. So I'm going to put the uh, camera right here, and we're going to shift the display down so you can see it. That's actually really not good. But anyway... When you set up Windows 3.1, it doesn't boot into Windows like you think it would. What it does is it boots into DOS. Because Windows 3.1 was kind of an afterthought. It was like, um, 
they call a DOS shell. That's all it is. It's not an operating system at all. It still needs DOS to do its job. So what we've got to do Go. What we've got to do is make it boot into Windows 3.1 automatically. I do that because it makes it easier to run it. I, I don't know. I just I think it's fun. All right. So we're going to go to Edit Auto Exec Dot Bat, and this is our auto execute file. Notice there's no mouse control because I haven't installed a DOS mouse driver at this point we're gonna do that angle this so you can see it so what I'm gonna do is at the very end I'm going to insert one line C colon backslash windows backslash win alright that's going to tell it to start Windows after all the um, after everything here is said and done. All right, save and restart. Control Alt Delete. Watch the magic happen. I'm gonna get these uh, floppy disks out of my way. Get them in a safe place. Okay. If I did this right, it should start Windows. There it goes. We actually need to install a few other things, too. Um, I need to install the display driver, which is actually on the video. This is uh, the video and mouse driver disk, and this is our hardware support disk. This contains our power management, and this one contains our video and mouse driver. So we're going to pop that into the floppy drive. I had to kind of go through these and figure out what was what based on you know what I know and what I don't know. <laughs> kind of fill in the blanks. So you want to make sure that we get our display driver installed by just running the setup from the root directory. This actually has a Western Digital Graphics card just to show how old it is, when Western Digital made graphics cards, it was, a, it was a different time. It was a very different time. You can hear that old SCSI drive humming in the background. All right. Continue. Now this allows us to install any of these drivers on our machine. I'm just going to install all of them. Hear that? Just powered down. The drive on the uh, on the old PowerBook has a timer. If it's not accessed within a certain amount of time, it powers down. Continue. if I hit the keys and stuff. If I open Macintosh HD, which you can't see me do, but I'm doing it, listen to a power back up again. Now, that's a lot of stress on a drive, especially one that's pushing 25 years old. It's actually older than that. <laughs> I think it's from 92. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit old, and... Uh, It's 24 years old, so yeah, it's 24 years old, still kicking though. Two years older than this one here, than this old NEC. All right, there we go, installation complete. We can now change the video driver, which is, uh, if I, go, I think it's in control panel now. Let's see. Oh, that's that's that sound. MIDI and all that happy stuff. Here it is. 
This is going to, you're going to notice a, uh, a bit of a, an increase in uh, color depth because I'm going to change it to, it's currently in 16 color mode. Windows 3.1's interface was designed for 16 color mode, which is why it looks decent. But once we bump it up, I'm going to do 200, I'm going to do 32,000. That's 16 bit color. It has one megabyte of memory, and at 640 by 480, it can handle it. If I change the resolution to 800 by 600, it will display it. But you actually, um, the screens, the display itself cannot handle that resolution. It's only an LCD. LCD panels are made for a very specific resolution. So I'm going to show you what happens. Now, first, we're going to, you know, let's do that first, and I'll show you just to get this out of the way what this would do. If I increase it to 800 by 600, we're going to restart Windows. I'm doing this for your benefit, not mine. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how you're benefiting from it, but it's worth showing because a lot of people didn't grow up around these systems and they don't know what to expect when they change settings. So, on a modern day laptop, the display will scale down to what, or scale up to whatever size you select. In 94, that didn't really happen. The driver, the, the display adapters were not capable of doing that. The, the LCD displays were not capable. So you'll notice that something is a little off here. Now, if I move the mouse over, look at that. It scrolls. And that's what happened in the old days. When you selected a resolution that your LCD panel was not capable of displaying. This is why LCD panels weren't so great for desktops because they well they did this stuff so now we're going to go back to 640 by 480 right not letting me select it it's not it's not letting me do it something in right here okay let's try this again Uh, now I, I think I may have caused a problem. I think it may have crashed, actually. Yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, I don't know why that's not working. All right, so let's just... Um, there we go. That was weird. Alright, so now we're at 16-bit color. You'll notice that the colors are slightly, oh, maybe not, the camera angle doesn't really do it any justice, but the colors are a little bit different on it now. Um, a little bit darker blue. We've opened up a lot of different color, op color options here. Um, you know, the grayscale is still grayscale, the blue is still blue, but it's a different shade of blue because we've expanded the color palette substantially. We went from 16-bit color, or 16 color, actually, 16, yeah, not 16-bit, 16, 16 color to 32,000 colors. You can only imagine what that'll do to a man. All right, go to desktop. We're going to change the background because I kind of want to do that anyway. I'm going to select my, uh, what did I use, um, Tartan. I like Tartan. It looks good on this old laptop. And why don't we go ahead and set our screensaver to flying windows. You don't need a screensaver with an LCD, but why not, right? I'm going to give it a five-minute delay. Now, the, the trick with the... Um, I'm going to show you one other thing here. With the flying window screensaver, if I test it here, you'll notice that it's really slow to start, and it kind of crawls at a snail's pace. If you go to setup and you change the speed to fast like so it's going to skip and jump and make all kinds of noise so let's, let's see what it does oh it actually kind of works but you'll notice that it shows the limitations of the processor if you do this on a Pentium class machine those windows will fly at you like like you're traveling through a minefield or uh, an asteroid field so you can see how it's kind of sluggish. Now there's a trick you can do. It's pretty simple. If you go to the number of windows, it's set to 25. By default, we're going to change it down to 10, which is its lowest amount. That's 10 windows 
at any given time. Hit OK and then run the test again. How to make the most of your Windows flying Windows screensaver. That's, that's how you do it. That's how it's done. Alright, that's about as good as it's going to get on a 486 DX2 running at 40 megahertz. Now we've got our display driver squared away. We're going to go and install our NEC approved mouse driver. Now you can use any generic mouse driver. I actually have a couple of different ones that I use on and off, but this machine has its own mouse driver that NEC issues, so we're going to use it. It's in the LCS mouse folder. I'm going to hit the installer. This is going to run in DOS, I believe. Or not. I think I have to run it in DOS um, generally. So we're going to just close out of Windows completely. There we go. Go to drive A. LCS mouse. We can just install. There are Windows components to this. DOS and Windows. See, is this the mouse software to accept? Hit yes. This is going to load the mouse driver in memory when the machine starts up so that anything that runs in DOS will have a DOS mouse driver available to it. So we're just going to hit continue to restart now. Take the disk out. And we'll see it pop up when we uh, restart the machine. So that's the video and mouse driver loaded. go. There it is. Installed in mouse port. Good. So we have a functioning mouse driver. Thank the Lord. So now running that auto execute bat edit file thing that we did earlier, we'd have a mouse available to us. Okay. It doesn't really do much in Windows because Windows has its own mouse driver. Um, so we're not really concerned about that. Now we're going to install the NEC power management tool. It's on the hardware disk. I was not able to successfully get the um, the suspend to disk partition created. I cannot find the tool to do it on this laptop. Uh, NEC does have tools for newer models. The funny thing is it's not even mentioned in the owner's manual so I know this laptop has that ability, but I'm not able to figure out how to make it work. Interesting. Um, looks like this also has the NEC mouse driver on it as well. NEC APM, that's NEC's Automatic Power Management or Advanced Power Management. We're going to run the, uh, the setup on that. What's the install do for us? I'm going to check that out real quick. Oh, that's got to be done in DOS too. Uh, setup is... Now, install is generally for DOS and setup is generally for Windows 3.1. That's how it used to be done. It wasn't consistent amongst everybody, amongst everyone, but... Let me, um... Let's, let's, let's do something here. Let's, let's, uh... I'm going to try, um... Let's see... A install. I'm not sure what this is going to do for us. Oh, that was in um, NEC APM. Okay. There's a DOS component and a Windows component to this. And I just wanted to get to the bottom of that real quick. Um, and I don't know what it did. C. DIR it didn't put anything there. Let's 
go into our executable here and see if it popped anything into there. I don't see, yeah, I see the mouse driver. That's about it. So it didn't, it didn't do anything, which is kind of frustrating. I was hoping maybe it would launch the um, suspend to disk setup function, but let's go back to Windows. It'll take care of the Windows portion of the installer. set up that XE file that we were talking about. The NEC APM extensions. Okay. Continue. Start. It does that. I don't know why it does that. There's something not quite right here. Um, not sure why that is. Didn't delete anything. Let's try the installer again. It's just uh, nothing. It's doing nothing. I'll give it a minute. It's not timing out or anything. I'm gonna uh, let's restart it. Or not. It it actually locked it right up, so let's <laughs> start over. Okay. Now there's also one other piece to this which I haven't quite figured out how to how to how to do. Um, the card soft drivers are also on this disk, but I'm not really sure how that works. I uh, honestly God, I can't figure out how to install it. There's no installer. It has to be done manually. So I'm not really sure how that all works. Um, so for the time being, I can't get any of the uh, any of my um, <clears throat> PC cards working. It doesn't do anything. Doesn't seem to do a thing. It could be defective. It could be a bad copy. I, you know, but it's only. I, I, yeah. It's only one. It's only one uh, file that I found on their website. It's, it's not like I can get it from somewhere else. But that's it, man. That's it, and we're pretty much good to go. All right. 
what I want to do now, I actually have a copy of um, SimCity. I think this is the Windows version. And we're going to throw it on there and see how well it works. Good running machine. I'm glad I found it. I'm, I'm glad it was given to me because I was able to um, kind of do something fun with it. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy these videos because you know they're they're kind of painful to make because it's so long. I hope somebody's watching it because I, I don't want to think I'm wasting my time. You know what I mean? All right. Let's. Uh, there should be a setup in here somewhere. Would you believe there isn't? I'm wondering... Yeah, there's no executable here. That's one of three. This is two of three. This is interesting. I wonder, oh, there's the setup exe. Let's see if it runs. Eh, maybe I labeled them wrong. Oh, I know what I have, okay. Here's what I've got to do. Let's see, Sims, uh, Sim City. All right. I have to copy the contents of drive A to drive C and then run it from there. That's how I that's how I made this uh, that's how I made all this work. So we're gonna do copy A to C. Notice how there's no browse feature. That was installed that was added in Windows 95. Um, SimCity Once I have all those files copied over, it's not doing it. Interesting. There's no select all option either. Interesting. Two C Sim City. It does exist. Really? Interesting. Can't say I've had. Well, you know, it's easier to do this in DOS anyway. So let's just get the hell out of Windows and do it the hard way. I've noticed I've had issues with File Manager before. What in God's green earth? It didn't make the directory. That's fucked up. We'll just do it this way. Copy A colon. Asterisk period asterisk to C colon. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. You got to be in the directory first. Almost made that mistake again. Otherwise, guess what happens? It puts everything in the root directory and it sucks.
All right. When that's done copying, we're going to copy disk. We're going to run the same command. We're going to copy disk two and three. I'm going to shut the camera off now. This is going to take a bit. One of the neat things about um, you know Windows 3.1 and all that happy stuff, if you run the setup from the DOS command, it launches Windows. Some sometimes, not everyone, not every, not every installer does this, but. Uh, my name in there. Okay. Once we have the installer complete, we'll be able to remove the um, <clears throat> that file or that folder we made. But what a, I, I don't think I've really used this installer very often. Um, so this was originally from a CD, and what I did is I, I actually put all the files, I fit them in a way that, or rearranged them so that they could be stuffed on three discs. That's why um, I had some a couple issues. Uh, in the process, but it's good to go. It's installed. All right, done, 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 and done. Setup failed. What? That's bullshit. It worked. Come on. Let's see if it works. It works. Oh. We can adjust the uh, PC volume on this thing. You can mute it. Low. Pretty cool, huh? I was blown away when I found that feature because not many, not many computers you can adjust the system volume. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna call this BB. PCM land. Look at that. We got our own city. God, that, that is annoying. Oh, no, I wanted to select me uh, easy. There we go. Now, how old is this game exactly? Well, I'll tell you. 1992. Pretty neat, huh? Is there a terrain map? There's a tornado going around there. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to disable disasters. So we're going to get rid of that tornado. Right quick. But yeah, SimCity. Okay, well that's enough for now. I think this video is long enough. We will continue... Uh, maybe I'll do a couple of game installations and we'll, we'll play with some software. There's one game I want to feature. It's called Solitile, but that deserves its own video. It's definitely a great time waster and uh, runs really well on everything. Um, the developer for Solitile, if you look it up right now, it was written by a gentleman named Everett Kayser. And he released a version for every platform, I believe, that uh, except for Linux or Unix. But there's a, I think there's a Mac version, there's an iOS version, there's a DOS version, which is the original. And he's still, in, he's still selling the game, it's still out there. I think, I, I know I bought the iOS version, but my parents were given a shareware copy of the DOS version in 1989. And that is the one I still use. <laughs> so, I'm like, when I found out he was still around, I'm like, no way. I downloaded it on my phone. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Solitile. Look it up. It's a great game. I have spent so much time playing that game. Um, I think I wasted about a couple years of my childhood just playing Solitile. And uh, I do not regret it one bit. So, 
there we go. What else do we have here? I got all kinds of shit. Wolfenstein, Kings of the Beach, Outrun. Ooh, Outrun. That's a good one. Um, Ford Simulator, Action Fighter, Beetlejuice, Auto Duel, Bubble Bobble, Ace of Aces, Gray Game only works on a uh, 8088 machine, but it's a good game nevertheless. Screen Piece. Ooh, Screen Piece. Let's put that on here. Screen Piece is the very first piece of software I ever bought myself. It is a shareware program. I think to run it, you have to type, it says it right on here. This was a company that used to distribute shareware and charge money for it. Um, they got away with it by selling the disc. They were selling you a disc, but they were really selling shareware. And uh, Screen Piece is one of the nicest uh, screensavers I've ever had. And uh, it's kind of what it is. It's kind of like a, a knockoff version of... Um, Uh, after Dark. That's what it really is. It's a knockoff After Dark. As a matter of fact, I wonder if it's still in here. I actually have a copy of After Dark. And maybe I'll install that instead. I've got the Tasmanian Devil screensaver. I've had this game. I've had the game. I've had the screensaver forever. It came with a mouse pad that my mom got me once. She got it for herself, actually, but she said it was for me. Um, she wanted the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's why she got it. But She just wanted this Tasmanian double mouse pad, and I'm like, all right, we can do that. But um, I'm not so sure where the hell it is. Zany Golf. Oh, man, all kinds of great stuff. Turbo Champions. But yeah, I have it in here somewhere. I, I, I'm pretty sure I do. But uh, yeah, we won't bother with screen piece. It's not going to give the laptop any uh, benefits, so I'm not going to bother with it. But yeah, all of these. Carmen San Diego. Oh, that's Mac. That's the Mac version. Is it really? What the hell's it doing in here? It doesn't need to be in here. Well, that's it for now. Thank you for watching. This is the final video in the Versa series. Um, yeah. Oh, back to our Mac PowerBook 170. I wanted to show you the screen cataracts that it has. So let's take a look. You'll notice it's been on for about half an hour and there's dark spots. It's darkening in the corners. I'm going to leave it on for a few more hours and see what it looks like then. But uh, I expect it to get much worse. You know, this started happening, I think, about a year or two after I got it running. Yeah, give or take. And, you know, it is what it is. You know, the display is obviously, it needs to be replaced, but it still functions. So, we'll count my blessings while they're there. Alrighty. Alright, after several hours, uh, probably about two or three hours, you can see that the corners turn completely black. Yeah, i got to find another screen for it at some point. Which is a shame because this is one of the best screens ever. This is the, um, the TFT display that came with the uh, PowerBook 170.